Let's take a look at laboratory exercise 18, joint structure and movements. We're here in the anatomy, human anatomy and physiology lab. And this is Mrs. Popplewell. Let's talk about the different types of joints. There's basically three different types of joints. There's fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints, the most common being the synovial joints. Now, fibrous joints, when we talked to one of the, our last visits together, we talked about these suture lines in lecture and in lab. We talked about suture lines of the skull that join these two plate-like bones together. And that suture line is considered a fibrous joint. Now, that fibrous joint, as a baby or a young child reaches age five or six, the fontanelles or the soft spot will fuse all the, these bones together. And once these bones have fused together and there's no more soft spot or, or um, partially fused bone there, it's completely fused, then those bones are immovable. We have a term for immovable, and that is called synarthrotic. Synarthrotic means immovable. There's no movement between those joints. They're basically fused together in that suture line. In the tibial fibular joint, okay, so the, remember we looked at the tibia and we looked at the fibula. The fibula was the smaller bone of the lower leg and the tibia the larger bone of the lower leg. They are joined together by a sheet of connective tissue um, and this connective tissue allows just oh so slight movement between those two bones. It's still considered a fibrous joint and there is little movement and we call that amphiarthrotic. So synarthrotic, no movement. The suture line was a fibrous joint, no movement, synarthrotic. Between the tibia and fibula, oh so slight movement and that would be amphiarthrotic. Cartilaginous joints are the second type of joints and here we have intervertebral discs these discs of cartilage that are found between these vertebrae, there is slight movement between each one of those vertebrae. And that slight movement that a, a, is allowed is amphiarthrotic. Now, wait a minute. There's slight movement, but you're turning quite a bit, so that shouldn't be slight movement. But between the two vertebrae, in that one joint, there's only very slight movement. It is the accumulative effect of all the vertebrae working together to give me my full range of motion. So if I have an injury and I have two vertebrae that have to be fused together, I will still be able to do this somewhat. It will be a little more limited, but because there's just a little movement between the two vertebrae. Now, if I had several vertebrae fused together, I might, I wouldn't have much movement at all. But because there's only a little movement between those vertebrae, the other vertebrae would, could compensate. You'd lose a very slight bit of range of motion, but not a whole lot. So between the two vertebrae, there are intervertebral discs. So that's a cartilaginous joint. And there's amphiarthrotic movement, slight movement. Another um, cartilaginous joint would be here between, this is the coxa, as we went over before. And in the front, this is actually called the pubis bone. And this is called the symphysis pubis. The symphysis pubis has a, a, a pad of cartilage and it allows for a slight movement. Now, slight movement in this pelvis would be like for childbirth. But for guys, too, there is a very slight movement in the pelvis. If they, they are playing tackle football, it would be pretty serious if somebody landed on top of them and this didn't give a little bit. 
the give helps to protect that pelvis. So there is just a very slight movement in the pelvis in the front where you have that pad of cartilage, so that's a cartilaginous joint in the symphysis pubis that allows oh so little movement for childbirth or for a car accident. If there's a blow to the pelvis, to the hip, then uh, with that slight movement, maybe we won't have a problem. Okay, so it is an amphiarthrotic joint also with slight movement. Now, synovial joints. Synovial joints allow freedom of movement, and when you have freedom of movement, they are called diarthrotic. Those joints with freedom of movement, synovial joints are the most numerous joints in the body, are called diarthrotic because there is freedom, freedom of movement. There are ball and socket joints. This is a ball and socket joint. Also, here in the hip is a ball and socket joint. Now, in the shoulder, where the, you have the humerus that articulates with the scapula, in this ball and socket joint, you have a larger range of motion than you would in the hip. Because in the hip, you have a, a thicker joint capsule, and you have many, many, many ligaments holding the head of the femur in the acetabulum of the coxa, so you don't dislocate that hip. And it's holding a lot more weight than up here would, so you have more range of motion in this ball, is, ball and socket joint than you do in the hip. Another type of synovial joint would be condylar. A condylar joint is right here. Okay, remember these were carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Where the metacarpal is and the proximal phalanx, this would be a condylar or condyloid joint. It, that just basically means it's a joint like this. Okay, it is a synovial joint and it allows for a pretty good range of motion there. You have a plane. These carpals gl sort of glide over each other. The tarsals in the foot sort of glide over each other. So it's called a plane or gliding joint. Now the elbow has several movements, but it's a hinge joint between the proximal, middle, distal phalanx. These are hinge joints. The movement allowed in a hinge joint is flexion and extension. Flexion, extension. Okay, in a hinge joint, movement is flexion and extension, the elbow, the knee, and between the phalanges, interphalangeal uh, movement. Pivot joint, we talked about the dens of the atlas with the axis, just slightly pivots in the neck. Also, we talked about um, the head of the radius being round and allows for this motion when you're, here's thumbs up, and then you have thumbs down, that is a pivot joint. It allows that joint to move without moving the ulna. So here's the thumb, so that's the radius. Follow the small finger and that's going to be the ulna. Turn the thumb down and this, that's this motion here. By the way, um, in just a second we'll talk about it. That's pronation supination. Okay, and the correct anatomical position is thumbs up. So pronation would be turning my thumb down. That radius is crossing over the ulna in that pivot joint in the elbow. So you have a hinge joint in the elbow, but you also have some pivot, uh, pivot joint in the elbow. Okay, saddle joint. We have dexterity and what gives us dexterity, dexterity and separates us from other animals is the dexterity of our thumb. And what gives us that is that saddle joint. 
So here you have a condylar joint. Here you have a hinge joint. At the base of the thumb, where the carpal meets the metacarpal, is the saddle joint. Let's go over those again. So remember that the thumb only has the proximal phalanx and the distal phalanx. All the other finger have a, fingers have a middle phalanx. The thumb, distal phalanx, proximal phalanx, and here would be the metacarpal, the carpals of the wrist. Okay, looking on this guy. Carpals, metacarpal, proximal phalanx, distal phalanx. Now, right here at the base of the metacarpal and the carpal would be the saddle joint of the thumb. It gives us our dexterity and separates us from other species. Let's look at, let's look at some movement allowed uh, in the body. And this is found in figure 18.2, the table 18.1, figure 18.2, and figure 18.3. Okay, flexion and extension. Now, as you are, uh, as a fetus develops in the womb and grows, it is in the fetal position. And basically, the fetal position is all flexed. So if you bring your arms up to your body, that is flexed. So this is flexion, and to extend it back out would be extension. Flexion, extension. That's the movement allowed in that hinge joint, by the way. Flexion and extension. Okay, flexion and extension. Now with the hand, it's a little bit different. This is flexion, extension, hyperextension. Okay, as we're moving a body part toward or away from the midline, it is abduction. Abduction. Putting it back toward the midline would be adduction. So away from the midline, ab is abduction. Back toward the midline, add, A-D-D, -D, adduction. Okay, ab away, adding it back, adduction. Circumduction, around. Medial rotation, lateral rotation. Now here it is, we talked about this when we were talking about that pivot joint. As we're thumbs down would be pronation, thumbs up supination, elevation, depression, elevation, depression. Now, I'm going to bring his foot up here so you can see this because you can't see mine very well. He's trying to grab me. As you bring the foot up toward the torso, that is called dorsiflexion. As you're pointing the toe, as in gymnastics, springboard diving, dance, pointing the toe is called plantar flexion. As you'll re you recall from exercise two, this is the plantar region, the bottom of the foot. To point the toe would be plantar flexion to bring the foot back up toward the torso would be dorsiflexion. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Turning the ankle inward, and I don't, I don't think this guy will do it, but turning the, the ankle inward would be inversion. Turning the ankle outward would be eversion. Now, turning the ankle in will uh, pull Ligaments that, you know, ligaments tie bone to bone. And ligaments do not have good memory or stretchability. So it's not like a rubber band that will automatically go back to its original shape. So once you 
uh, have inversion of that foot where you twist that ankle inward it uh, enough to pull those ligaments then you're probably going to do it again and to remain a little stretched. Now eversion when you turn the ankle outward or turn the foot outward and stretch those ligaments you're probably going to even tear some ligaments and maybe break a bone. So it's more serious when you have a sprain where you have had eversion of that ankle inversion. Um, yes, you can have some hematoma or breaking of the blood vessels and some bruising and stretching of those ligaments and pain. And if you don't do it too hard, you probably won't break anything. But... Um, you, you get over it, but eversion is a little bit more serious than an inversion. So turning that ankle inward toward the midline would be inversion. Out toward medially, or excuse me, laterally, would be eversion. Projection. Okay, projection, retraction. Projection, retraction. See if there's anything else we need to look at. Now, let me say this about your lab manual. Sometimes there are exercises that you will label or put letters on one page or label on one page and the picture will be on another page. I recommend that you actually label where you see the picture. So it's a little easier to study when you're labeling right on top of the picture. And with exercise 18, that would be the case. So we'll talk more about that next time. Thank you.